and welcome back to Mind Over Chatter, the Cambridge University podcast. I'm James. I'm Nick. And I'm Annie. And once again, we're inviting you to join us in our conversations with clever, curious people here in Cambridge. In this third series, we're talking about health. And in this episode, we're focusing on obesity. We're going to cover everything from... Why some people are genetically more likely to gain weight than others. The important role the environment plays in influencing what we like to eat. And how communicating information about obesity doesn't necessarily change our behaviour. So, who are we talking to in this episode? A health psychologist. Hello, I'm Teresa. I'm a psychologist and behavioural scientist. A geographer. Hi, I'm Tom. Uh, I'm a senior research associate in the MRC Epidemiology Unit. And a clinician scientist. Hi, I'm Sadaf. I'm a professor of metabolism and medicine. As usual, we began by asking our guests to tell us about their research. I'm interested in trying to find out why some people are much more likely to gain weight than others. Uh, how that's influenced by our genes, and using genetics to try to find out the systems that the body has for controlling a person's weight. Uh, my work, as I said, is is focused on understanding the social and particularly neighbourhood kind of determinants of diet and health. Um, but I do a lot of work in the evaluation of public health interventions, and really I have a key focus on translating that evidence into um, public health policy and practice where, where reasonable. I'm interested in identifying the cues in our immediate environment that shape our behaviour, often without our awareness, such as the size of a pizza or a wine glass, and often to the detriment of our health. And I'm interested in identifying those cues in order to work out the cues that could be removed or added to our everyday environments with a view to changing our behaviour and improving the health of everybody. Let's start by understanding what obesity actually is. Sadaf, could you tell us what it means to be obese? Yeah, so obesity is when people have too much fat to a level that then affects health. Um, And because it's not that easy to measure the actual amount of fat, we tend to use height and weight uh, to calculate something called body mass index or BMI. And that's a useful surrogate for the amount of fat someone has in the body. And so we know that if there, someone has a BMI of more than 30, that equates to obesity and that equates to an increased risk of certain conditions like type 2 diabetes. So can you give us a sense, along with diabetes, of some of the impacts that obesity might have on our health? Yes, yeah, so obesity can impact a person's health in many ways. So there's an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. Actually, even some forms of cancer are more po- common in people who struggle with their weight. Indeed, obesity is likely to overtake smoking as a major cause of cancer in many countries. Um, But obesity is also linked with uh, impact on the joints, on impact on breathing, on impact on hormone levels, um, and importantly, on depression, on well-being, and the substantial stigma actually associated with people uh, who are severely obese. Can I just uh, check with you, Sadaf? Reading a recent review, I think it's also one of 12 modifiable risk factors for dementia, so affecting cognitive decline. Yes, no, it's a major uh, association with with dementia and and neurodegenerative disease. Absolutely right. And roughly sort of how many people, um, either in the UK or or worldwide, are obese? So in the UK, it's between 20 to 25 percent of the population are clinically obese using that definition of a BMI of more than 30. Um, And actually, if you relax the definition a little bit to say how many people are overweight or obese, then that's about 50% of people. So it's really a a large proportion of our population. The same is true in many countries, um, developed countries and Western countries. And of course, the prevalence is rising in many countries around the world, for example, in in Asia, um, and already is quite high in the Middle East. And how about how the population has changed? Like, how heavy are we compared to, say, 20 years ago? Has that changed over time? So, yes, it has changed. If you look at the population trends, um, and and Tom and Theresa may also want to input here, is that two major things have broadly changed. So the average person is heavier than they used to be, children and adults, okay? Um, But also there's a change in the distribution. So there's always been some people who were particularly heavy, and some people actually who are particularly thin. 
But now what we're seeing, and it's driven by the changes in our environment, is a greater proportion of the population have obesity and indeed severe obesity. Um, this might sound like a bit of an obvious question, but how exactly does what we eat and how much we eat affect us? So are people obese because they eat too much or because they're eating the wrong sorts of food? So, so basically the reason that people gain weight is an imbalance between how much you eat and how many calories you burn. Okay, um, But the imbalance only has to be quite small and do that consistently over time to explain the trends in the population that we see. So everyone sort of imagines that we must be eating absolutely loads and doing absolutely nothing. In fact, that's not the case. It's a small imbalance across many, many people that explains entirely the change that's happening in the population. Now, then you could look into, okay, well, why are we eating more than we're expending in terms of energy? Well, of course, our environment has directly changed in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, The type of food the fact it's um, cheaply available, easily available, the amount of food, the calorific content of the food. So all of those things are combined, really. Um, And of course, we're much less active than we used to be. So both at work and in leisure time. Um, And so those changes add up. And then the balance basically tips. Um, And then the other factor underlying that is our genetics. Now, genetics hasn't changed, but our genes influence how we respond to the environment. So in the same environment, some people were much more likely to gain weight than others. Another thing that I'd add to that, Sudaf, really a clue to what might be driving some of these changes is the pattern of obesity in different places. And what we can see is that those living in areas that are least affluent have higher rates of obesity than those living in more affluent areas. Um, If we can come on now just to say a little bit about childhood obesity, Uh, only last week the latest figures were published from the National Child Measurement Programme, which is a fantastic programme, which gives us data uh, on a regular basis uh, going into schools and uh, weighing, weighing children. And those figures were really shocking. And what they showed was that over the last 12 months during the pandemic, the uh, incre- there's been a, a four percentage point increase in the proportion of children aged 10 to 11 who are now obese having gone from, I think it's 21% to 25%. Um, And and just to um, illustrate the point about the social patterning of obesity, it's uh, around 33% of children in the least affluent areas who age 10 to 11, who uh, are now classified as obese, compared with just uh, 14% in the most affluent areas. So you can see it's a huge, huge divide. Yeah, they are really shocking. Almost the inequality is more shocking than the than the absolute rate, which, you know, to some degree, certainly before the pandemic, might have been seen to be kind of leveling off in that kind of increasing trend that we've observed. But the inequalities have always kind of been increasing, and I don't think uh, uh, have leveled off yet. But um, I, I guess, as Theresa said, like the, the clue might be what, people's neighborhoods look like possibly so in those deprived areas you know we've got 50 percent more fast food outlets for example compared to those more affluent areas and perhaps that's playing into why we've got almost 50 percent more obesity we've also got less green space fewer parks Um, we've also got more dangerous streets Uh, i was reading the other day that uh, pedestrians are three times more likely to be injured in the least affluent areas compared to the most. So uh, I think looking at those immediate environments, both the food environments and uh, the physical activity environments, is is going to be key uh, to thinking about what we can do to halt uh, the, the, the growing gap between the richest and the poorest Um, and start to reverse it. Do we think that gap is all environment? So, you know, in some ways it seems perhaps a counterintuitive idea that those in some of the least affluent environments 
are those who are suffering worst from obesity, the highest prevalence of obesity. Is it just environment? How do we understand that, that difference? Well, it depends what we mean by environment. <laughs> okay, so just to be really academic and awkward about it, um, you know, it, it, our environment might be our, you know, our, our household, it might be our, our family, it might be our neighborhood, it might be the country that we live in, right? I think Sadaf might have a, a different idea of what our environment is, but, you know, it's the, it's the bigger picture and it's, it's all of these things that come together to shape kind of what we eat, yeah, and how much exercise we do. One of the factors, whether you call it environmental or not, is poverty. Um, some of the work that Tom has done has shown that low income is an independent um, risk factor predictor of obesity. And low income can work in several ways. There have been some really interesting studies that have been conducted looking at how poverty um, drains our mental capacity, our ability to think about other things. So um, some studies that were done a few years ago looking at Indian farmers, cane, cane sugar farmers, and giving them challenging cognitive uh, tasks. And when they were given these immediately before a harvest where they, were, uh, they had little money in the families, they did much more poorly on those on those uh, tests than after the harvest had come in. And what they were able to do was to uh, control for nutritional status and various other things to show that actually, I mean, it seems common sense that uh, if you're concerned about getting enough money into your household, you can't be thinking about, shall we go out to the park to play or thinking about um, buying food to prepare a meal from scratch. It's also another, uh, uh, unfortunately not that much evidence, but from natural experiments whereby when small amounts of income comes into the poorest households, sort of intriguing, sort of counterintuitive uh, findings that those households then reduce their spending on tobacco and alcohol and increase their spending on fruit and vegetables. And it's thought that that might work by reducing stress in those families. So as well as the uh, immediate food environments and activity environments, uh, I think we shouldn't underplay the role of having a low income and how that can affect all of the behaviours we're interested in. Uh, and what I'd add to that is, you know, Healthy foods do, in general, tend to be more expensive. Tend to be more expensive. So you know, if you're if you are extremely price sensitive, if you only have a limited budget, you know, you can get an awful lot of calories, for example, in in your local kind of fish and chip shop or fast food outlet or whatever for a pound. You know, like if you if you're looking to just feed yourself, um, actually, the paradox is that you probably end up eating kind of energy dense, nutrient poor food on a on a limited budget. And is that the case everywhere? Is that a particularly British phenomenon? It's not a British phenomenon. Um, but I think that the, 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 the gap perhaps um, is one, you know, we have one of the largest gaps in terms of um, the proportion of people both at the, the lower end of the socioeconomic deprivation and, and high end. Uh, and, and I think we have you know, in the US and other countries also, they see the same thing. So across globally, obesity rates are higher in areas with socioeconomic deprivation. In the UK, um, amongst other countries in Europe, uh, we have the highest proportion of food that we bring into our house that is ultra processed. I think it's 52%. So uh, in, in, in Europe, we are outliers in terms of um, some of our foods. So what then does a healthier country look like? It's a great question, but it's a, it's a big question, right? It's, a, it, it's, almost, it's almost a completely different country to the one that we currently exist in, to be honest, in almost every single way. Um, you know, my, my, my research focuses on neighbourhoods and that's what I'm interested in. And, you know, so I'll speak to that. I, I think a healthy neighbourhood is one in which healthy choices are the easy choices because the easy choices are the choices that people will make more often. 
you know so at the moment we we have a situation where actually the unhealthy choices in most neighborhoods are the easy choices um, and actually healthy choices are almost impossible to find for some people you know it might be that in one's neighborhood 50 percent of what i have available to me is fast food and that 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 isn't you know that isn't making the healthy choice the easy choice so um i i think that we need to radically change what our neighborhoods look like in order to kind of encourage people to make those healthy choices mind if we pause a minute to gather our thoughts not at all so we started off with a definition of what we're talking about with a definition of obesity. Yes, always a good place to start, especially with academics. They like definitions. We heard that obesity is the name given to the situation when the amount of fat someone is carrying begins to affect their health. But it's not particularly easy to measure the amount of fat directly, so we use other measures. A common one is BMI, or body mass index, which is calculated using your height and weight. You can work out your BMI online if you're interested. If someone has a BMI of more than 30, this would mean they're obese, which in turn increases that person's risk of certain health conditions, such as type 2 diabetes. How else can obesity affect our health? We heard that obesity can cause high blood pressure, heart diseases, and even some forms of cancer. Yeah, apparently obesity is likely to overtake smoking as a major cause of cancer in some countries. Wow. Obesity can also have an impact on the joints, breathing, and hormone levels, and in some cases can lead to depression. Unfortunately, there's substantial stigma attached to severe obesity, which is one of the reasons why mental health can be affected. Obesity has also been associated with dementia and cognitive decline. What do we know about how many people are obese? Somewhere between 20 to 25% of the UK population are clinically obese, which means they have a BMI of over 30. But if you relax the definition a little, and instead ask how many people are overweight or obese, then it's about 50% of us. So a significant proportion of the population then? Yep, I'm afraid so. Probably a significant proportion of this Zoom room too. And the same is true in lots of other countries, with the number of obese people rising across the world. So obesity is on the increase, but how did we get here? Well, Sadaf told us about two major things that have changed in the last 20 years when it comes to obesity. Thing number one. The average person is heavier than they used to be, and this is the case for both children and adults. Thing number two. There's been a change in the distribution. There have always been people who weigh more or less than others, but we're now seeing a greater proportion of the population suffering from obesity. And what did we learn about how we eat and how much we eat affects our weight? On a basic level, people are obese because they either eat too much or eat the wrong types of food. But the picture is not quite that simple. Sadaf told us that our environment has a big impact. For example, the calorific content of food has increased over the last 20 to 30 years, as well as how easily available it is. Another important factor is genetics. Unfortunately, some people are genetically more likely to gain weight than others. Teresa also told us about how income affects obesity. People living in less affluent areas have higher rates of obesity than those living in more affluent areas. This makes sense if you remember that healthy foods tend to be more expensive. So if you've got a low income, you can get energy dense, nutrition poor food very easily. For example, from the local chippy. Tom also highlighted that there can be 50% more fast food outlets in deprived areas compared to more well-off areas, which might impact obesity rates. Sadaf raised the point that although this isn't a British phenomenon, we do have one of the largest socioeconomic gaps between the rich and the poor. The USA, for example, sees similar patterns, but remarkably in the UK we have the highest proportion of food that is ultra-processed. And are there things that we can do on a kind of micro level or is it more that those kind of changes have to happen on a more macro level to do with policy and government? Thinking about just uh, sticking with what Tom has said, talking about neighbourhoods, um, very crudely, uh, I, I think sometimes it's helpful to divide up the world into a commercial sector. So those would be the shops we go into, the cafes that we frequent um, and the public sector. Um, so that would be schools, um, hospitals. And of course, we all know that the world isn't quite that simple, but let's pretend it is simple for the moment. And thinking about the food courts in some of our hospitals, um, 
they would be a great place to be able to start um, to actually model what a healthy and sustainable um, set of foods would look like. Um, and to take that uh, as a, a way of modeling to people, because I think most people have got absolutely no idea what a healthy portion might look like, what a healthier set of foods would look like. Um, and I think in that way, then people would uh, begin to see what it is that uh, we're missing and where we're trying to, uh, what, what, what kinds of changes we're, we're trying to make. In terms of your question about whether this is an individual, many people focus on the role of governments and policymakers in terms of setting the food environment. Okay, um, So there's some recent examples from Singapore, for example, where they have brought into place a series of policy changes which are about changing the local environment, which is everything from... Uh, what's a, but actually they've got buy-in. Of course, it's a small place and you can control and regulate many things. Uh, what is being provided in supermarkets, uh, also the pricing of foods, as well as the opportunities for activity in the workplace. So, for example, uh, as well as in schools. So, you know, people in a way are doing some of the large-scale kind of experiments in a way as part of policy changes. Um, and the Singapore experiment, so to speak, I think will be quite interesting. They actually have quite relatively lower rates of obesity, of course, compared to us, but it's risen from what it used to be. I, I think it's a real challenge to translate some of the research um, that changes our food environments that could improve our health. So just to give you a couple of examples from research in my own group, um, recently uh, we conducted a study in 19 worksite uh, cafeterias, and these were um, distribution centers for a major supermarket group. And uh, they were used by, oh, the vast majority were um, non-managerial manual workers and also men. So a group that have a higher rate of, of obesity uh, than those not in, in those groups. And um, these worksite cafeterias were used by over 20,000 uh, employees. And um, we did two things. Um, First of all, uh, we shifted the proportion of higher energy foods to lower energy foods. So, for instance, for main meals, um, we uh, took, uh, uh, just to uh, a rough uh, example, in uh, most of the cafeterias, around three out of four of the main meals were above 530 calories. So what we did was we shifted them to having two out of four that were above uh, 530, so to have more that were uh, at 530 or below, and for the desserts, capping those at 310 calories. So, uh, so the same number of meals were being offered, but you just had a greater proportion that were lower calorie. And um, we did that for a while, and then for the higher calorie uh, meals, we then cut the portion size by about 10%. So people didn't really notice these changes. And what we found was that over a period of uh, 25 weeks, where we were running the studies, that we reduced the calories that were being bought in across all these cafeterias by just over 11%. So that's an important uh, difference and worth going for. We've published that, we've published similar other studies, but these findings aren't necessarily adopted. Um, and it, it's, it's, that's the challenge, really, as to how to do that. Just to give another example where not only were the findings not adopted, but actually the unhealthier options were um, became more common in a, a series of experiments we've conducted in restaurants, looking at how the size of wine glasses affects how much alcohol people consume. Now, 
not for children or most children, but for adults, uh, for those who consume alcohol, it's an important contributor towards obesity. Um, for those who consume alcohol, it can be between 5 and 10% of their energy intake. So we were interested in how the size of wine glasses, which have doubled over the last 30 years, affects how much people are drinking. And what we found is that in restaurants where they're serving usually bottles of wine, serving the wine in smaller wine glasses um, does reduce how much wine people are drinking uh, by about 7%. Uh, so a wine glass that is uh, 300 milliliter capacity compared with 370 milliliter capacity. Now, when we conducted the first experiment in uh, the pint shop in, in Cambridge, um, the owners uh, found it really interesting, and uh, they uh, what they did was they got rid of their smaller wine glasses. And why wouldn't you? Because they could increase their sales. And I think that this importantly points out the asymmetry of evidence that's needed for public health intervention. So one study absolutely isn't enough to start regulating, but it is enough in the commercial sector um, to capitalise on what might be, and they were absolutely right, a, is a finding that was replicated. Um, I want to ask, so you've talked to us a little bit about the pint shop, which I know personally. You've talked to us about work based cafeterias, for example, but I want to talk perhaps a little bit about schools and educational environments and ask Sadaf about um, the education around food, diet and exercise within schools. So can you tell us a little bit about that and maybe about how education about and around obesity might affect childhood obesity? We touched on canteens a little bit, but we didn't touch specifically on school canteens uh, and why they're a particularly challenging kind of challenging space. And I think actually a lot of the challenge with school canteens is keeping kids in the canteen at lunch because they're not, you know, it doesn't really matter what they sell. You know, they're not cool places to hang out. The atmosphere often isn't great, you know, um, and they would rather leave the school grounds at lunch and go and hang out at the local takeaway because it's more appealing and it's a better place to socialize. So you know, it's all well and good kind of improving what's on the menu, but it's it's actually about keeping them there so they can benefit from those improvements. There are also these trials that have been conducted in schools over the last 10, 10 years um, that have been very uh, elegantly designed that have looked at uh, changing both the food environments and also just the whole of the school day uh, to increase levels of activity in the school children and sometimes the teachers. And what those are telling us is that so far those interventions are not having a measurable impact on levels of physical activity or obesity in children. And it's drawn attention to the wider environment that maybe those active schools would be more effective if the environment outside of school was also supporting um, healthier food environments and more physical activity. Perhaps kids are healthier when they're not at school because they're not spending time in and around the school, which is kind of where takeaways are clustering in order to capitalize on the student pound. You know, there's a there's a disproportionately greater access to takeaways around schools than there is in other areas. So may, <laughs> that's an interesting. And has zoning worked? Has zoning worked? Because there has been talk of keeping fast foods away uh, to more than 400 yards from schools or meters? Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, whether it's worked is the question that we're answering right now in our research. But we know that 40 or so local oh. authorities out of 320 in England at the moment have implemented so-called exclusion zones around schools. So going forward, no more new takeaways will be allowed to open. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's an ongoing question. We'll find out in the next couple of years whether it has worked. Of course, there's already an existing high number of takeaways. So you would almost certainly, I think, to have a real effect, need to intervene on what's there as well as what, you know, what is, what is new to those environments. Um, but again, that just reinforces, doesn't it, the, 
the need to have multiple complementary yeah. interventions across in lots of different ways in yeah, order yeah. to really tangibly yeah. impact health. I, I was just uh, I was going to pick up in terms of how we respond to information and uh, communicating risks. Um, and uh, what we know is that uh, it's, it's a very um, popular intervention, both with governments and also with general publics. We love, you know, we're very happy for governments to give us information. But uh, while it increases our awareness of a problem, such as um, our diets and how they're um, affecting our weight and our health, it, it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't change our behaviour. And, and this is... Uh, fascinating. So that, that's led people to think, oh, well, maybe it's because the information is too general. So telling people to eat five pieces of fruit and veg a day, uh, certainly we're much more aware we should be doing doing that. But when it's evaluated, it, it, it doesn't change our behaviour. So it, it, it led to um, a, a lot of um, in, interventions to personalise the risk um, using genes and other biological markers um, and, and say some of the, um, the best uh, studies have been conducted uh, by colleagues of mine I here in, in Cambridge where uh, taking a group of often uh, middle-aged uh, adults and assessing their risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes in the next 10 years and uh, uh, giving them that risk and telling them that if they increase their levels of physical activity, maybe lose a little bit of weight, they could reduce those risks. And actually, it doesn't change their behaviour. Um, and it, it's, it's such an important finding because what it highlights is certainly what, as psychologists, we've known for the last 50 or more years, which is that we are much more influenced by our context or immediate surrounds than what's inside our heads. So again, this draws attention to the need to look at the triggers in our environment, the cues in our environment that are leading us to overconsume. So it's not a reason, so I, I just to emphasize, I'm, I'm not against education at all. Indeed, working in a university, uh, that would be slightly problematic. Um, but in terms of changing our behavior, uh, it doesn't do it. But it's very important that people are aware uh, of, of the risks that they, they face. So I'm, I would add a slightly, not a different, more a sort of more parallel explanation for what you just described, Teresa. So absolutely, and, and several studies have shown that whilst we like to think that explaining pe to people the risk might cause a change in, bring about a change in behavior, many studies have shown that doesn't happen necessarily. So it's interesting that you concluded that um, it's kind of your environment that is therefore influencing what you do. But I guess the other conclusion is it's also your biology that is influencing what you do, right? So, and of course, the two are not separate. So, or three are not separate. So, you know, one of, one of the challenges with advising people to change diet and activity and assuming that that's sufficient, and that actually has been the cornerstone of policy in the UK and many other, you know, this personal responsibility, um, is that we assume that everything is under voluntary control uh, and that people will therefore, if given the information, be able to do this and enact a change. Um, but obviously their environment may, if it remains unchanged, is a kind of competing influence. But the other thing, of course, is your genetics and your biology. So what we and others have shown is that actually how much you eat, how full you feel, uh, are traits that are strongly influenced by our genes. And so people are often quite surprised about this because we tend to think that how what we eat and our eating behavior is voluntary. Actually, part of it is voluntary and part of it is learned from exposure in our environment, but a strong part of it is biological. Um, and we know that, and, and many people have done studies, for example, in twins. So if you take identical twins, they tend to have a very similar body weight as adults, even if they're separated at birth and live in a completely different environment. Some very elegant studies from Jane Wardle in London showed that if you look at children who are twins, uh, they have a very similar body weight 
and it's actually to do with them being a twin and the genetic influence rather than the shared childhood environment, which everybody assumed it was down to the childhood environment. Actually, it's down to the much more down to the genetics than it is down to the childhood environment. And our genes affect our weight predominantly by affecting our appetites. Okay, So how hungry you feel, even if you're given the same amount of food, how full you feel after that meal is strongly genetically influenced. So it's very similar in twins. Okay. Um, and so one of the challenges is that you can advise people, but if they are, and there are quite a lot of people have a tendency to want to eat more, um, and the things that they might choose to eat are strongly influenced by the environment that we live in, then actually it's quite hard to fight against that. And I think that's almost like the kind of pulling together of the lessons from our different areas of research. Um, and that's something that we've been trying to see if we can bring that kind of broader view to influence policy. Because I think if policy changes are only about telling people what to do and saying it's your personal responsibility, it hasn't worked for at least 30, 40 years, and it's unlikely to continue to work. Just shouting a bit louder is, is unlikely to enact a change. I think there's a, a, a great uh, balance to, to what I said, uh, Sadaf, and thinking about really the gene environment interaction. And I can't remember, maybe you, you know, um, the islands from which a large number of people went to the US and um, because they had a genetic predisposition to obesity that wasn't evident in their uh, original uh, place, um, suddenly finding themselves in this obesogenic environment in the US, high, high rates of obesity. Can you remember where, which? Yeah, I so it's, I mean, it's actually happened in pretty much several, several ethnic groups, or every ethnic group that has migrated to the US has changed, has seen a dramatic change in their prevalence of obesity. Um, but of course, the, the degree of change has also varied across the ethnic groups. So some groups are much more susceptible than others. So there's a group that in, in which many studies have been done called Pima Indians. Uh, and so they have a very high risk and they've come from parts of Mexico, for example, and Mexican Americans have the same. Um, so all ethnic groups have a higher risk when they move to an obesogenic environment, but the, there's a graded response depending upon your genetic susceptibility. You know, we're hearing from Sadaf how and why genes are really important when it comes to obesity. We're also hearing from Teresa how the environment can pattern what we might consume. Tom, as a geographer who looks at neighbourhoods, is clearly also focusing on the environment. But how do you think about this interaction between our genetic disposition to, to eat in some way, if I can phrase it like that, and then the way in which the environment influences that eating behaviour. Yeah, I think it's, in, it's entirely possible, isn't it, that for any given level of exposure to one's neighbourhood, for example, some people will be more or less likely to use those cues, right, and to act on those cues in the environment. And maybe genes have a, have a role in predisposing some individuals more than others, just as having a low income or a, a, a different level of education might kind of predispose somebody to use those types of um, types of environments. Um, so, but it is hard to say, it's really hard, isn't it, to say, well, this sphere, these, this particular set of factors contributes X, and it's more or less than this other set of factors, right? It's, you know, the key question is, you know, does this, does this risk factor kind of contribute? And if so, you know, we need to act on this as well as acting in these other spheres. Um, what we've been doing, certainly over the last seven or eight years, is studying neighbourhoods quite closely and really focusing in on, on fast food exposure. Um, and what we have found in big studies of kind of up to 50, 60,000 adults is that people who, uh, groups of people who live in neighbourhoods with the most takeaways are almost twice as likely to be obese and on average kind of 1.2 units of BMI heavier than those who are least exposed to takeaways. Um, so, you know, what we've started to kind of unpick is that, that, that there is probably, or the evidence suggests there is probably a role for the neighborhood environment in kind of shaping what we eat. But it's really hard, at least for me, to kind of stack that up against the genetic determinants like that and, and say whether it is more or less important. But it, it contributes. Well, I think the key is that it's not, it's not one or the other. Okay, so, so the key thing is not genes versus environment, which is how it's tended to be phrased in, for, in many diseases, many traits. Uh, it's actually genes and environment. Um, 
Um, so genes clearly play a major role. We have children referred to me with severe obesity from countries like Sudan, from rural India, you know, developing severe obesity because a single gene is not working. So there's a strong genetic influence. And then, you know, that's relatively rare, but across many people, there are lots of different genes which when added together influence your risk of both obesity and also of staying thin, actually. So we've shown that being very thin is as heritable as severe obesity. Uh, and there are people who are thin have less of the genes associated with obesity and have additional genes that are keeping them thin. So genetic factors act right across the spectrum. Now, of course, our environment, uh, the immediate food environment, as Tom described, and of course, the way, for example, that uh, Teresa described cues and if you like, um, you know, things in our environment influence our behavior are all interacting. Okay, And one of the ways they're interacting is if you're genetically susceptible and you have a big appetite, so to speak, Okay, then if those kind of foods are the ones that are more readily available and you're being exposed to certain cues which might encourage you to want to eat those foods, then you're the kind of person who's much more likely to gain weight. Okay. And we're talking about foods. We tend to think that it's just this: the food is available and the person is making a, the bad choice, so to speak. But actually, you know, there's biology underlying what food you choose, right? So uh, we and others, and Teresa and I have done some collaborative work in this kind of space as well. Um, you know, your brain will prefer things like high-fat food or high-calorie foods, okay? And so it's not a new just down to what we tell people is in the food or how we advise them, the actual content of the food will trigger different responses in the brain. So you can put somebody into a brain scanner and you can visualize that. And you can see areas of the brain that light up with, say, a, a high-fat milkshake versus a low-fat milkshake, even when you control for other parameters, like the taste and the sweetness and the the uh, the mouthfeel of the milkshake. Um, so, you know, we like foods that are rewarding, uh, often with high in calories or high in fat. And of course, the food companies know this, right? So this is why we will eat more of certain types of food, um, because it's rewarding for us. But I think as, as, as um, you were saying, Sadaf, it's the gene environment interaction. And where can we intervene um, with some of the extremes? Uh, you've done some innovative work where you can uh, identify uh, deficiencies and intervene. But actually for general populations, where we intervene is in the environment. Um, and it, it will likely have a larger effect for some, for some of these uh, individuals that have that genetic load, as it were. But it's, it's about uh, changing, changing our environments, both our food environments and um, our activity environments. So I would I would agree. I mean I think I think what's happened so to date is our policy has been only about thinking about the environment and has ignored all the things that we've discussed that actually it's not as simple as just telling changing the environment, which we haven't actually done, uh, or telling people what to do in that environment, because actually it's all of these complicated factors. So you know a policy, maybe a, you know at a simplistic level, has to both influence our environment and what we're exposed to to have an effect on as many people as possible. But it has to recognize that it's not, um, you know, a simple thing and that people are different, both in terms of their genetics, but of course, also in terms of the money they have available. That's a massive factor. Um, and there has to also be a policy that is recognizes that that won't be sufficient for people with severe obesity who have healthcare needs and who need medical care and medical treatment. And that's actually been something that's been quite neglected in the UK. So, you know, given the complexity and given the number of people involved uh, who are affected and the fact that we need to reduce the number of people who will be affected in the future, in particular children, um, a very joined up strategy is really what has to be considered. Um, colleagues, colleagues of ours in, in Cambridge have recently done an analysis of uh, obesity strategies in the UK over the last 30 years. And uh, we've, we've had 14 strategies and nearly 700 policies. And as we described earlier, 
rates of obesity have not stalled and in children they've actually uh, increased. So uh, that raises the question. It's, I don't think that we're stuck for ideas and much of what we've talked about just now have been included in recent independent reports and government strategies. I think the problem comes with some of the least effective interventions have been implemented, uh, some of the information-based ones, and those that have been implemented haven't been implemented uh, you know, at, at, at scale. So I, I think that there's uh, a real uh, problem, which probably goes beyond our expertise to think about the political economy, the political science of implementing policies that are going to make a real difference. But there have been some successes, right, Theresa? So, for example, the the UK's soft drinks industry levy, which I guess some of your listeners might know is kind of the sugar tax on sugar sweetened beverages. You know, like uh, members of my group have evaluated kind of the success or one marker of success of that intervention at kind of one year post adoption. And, you know, households in the sample that they studied were consuming, you know, 10% less sugar you know, but they weren't drinking any less soft drinks, any fewer soft drinks. They're still drinking the same volume of soft drinks. The the, the industry is still selling the same, the same volume of soft drinks, so they're quite happy. But the reduction in sugar is 10%, and that's because this tax wasn't passed on to consumers. Instead, it, it encouraged reformulation of the product, right? So kind of everyone wins in that example, and it's it's it doesn't rely on the individuals to to do anything to engage with this intervention, you know, they're, they're being offered healthier products and, you know, it's kind of a win-win. And that, that at least kind of one year post-intervention in this uh, evaluation, that, that seems to have been tremendously successful. I, I completely agree. But during the same time frame, as I recall, sales of chocolate and confectionery have gone up. So that doesn't counter what you're saying at all. What it's saying is that here was a policy that was effective, but we need lots of policies in order to change the food environment so that we've got the healthier foods that are available and affordable. And so it's really going at scale with more than one intervention. Okay, let's pause again. What did our guests have to say about possible interventions to deal with rising levels of obesity? We heard that food courts in public sector buildings, such as hospitals, for example, could be great places to model healthy food and healthy food environments to people. Teresa also spoke about the challenges of translating research that's been done on food environments into useful policies. She gave examples from worksite cafeterias, where we tend to see higher rates of obesity. As part of a study, these cafeterias offered more low-calorie meals and cut the portion size by 10%. Turns out, nobody really noticed. I'd like to see that study ran back at the Dolan household. There would, I confidently predict, be revolution. Unfortunately, these important findings, and others like them, haven't really been adopted. In fact, sometimes unhealthier options were actually adopted after studies like these. Yeah, Teresa told us about an experiment where a pub in Cambridge offered smaller wine glasses, which reduced how much people drank by about 7%. Probably because they left early after getting tired pouring so many itsy-bitsy tiny glasses from their regular size bottle. I don't think the wine glasses were thimble-sized. Or because they lost their voices ordering so many tiny, tiny glasses of wine. Again, I think you're overestimating how small these glasses were. Apparently the pub in question, the pint shop, took advantage of these results to invest in larger wine glasses to boost their sales. And who can blame them? And what's the deal with schools? As far as I'm aware, schools did not invest in larger wine glasses as a result of this study. That's, that wasn't really what I meant. Well, we heard that canteens are not cool places to hang out. And here comes the crushing realisation that my love of the canteen was yet another way in which I was resoundingly uncool at school. Tom told us there's a disproportionately higher number of takeaways around schools than they are in other areas. Which is how we got on to zoning, the effort to keep fast food outlets no more than 400 yards from schools. 400 yards being about as far as anyone has ever been able to propel a burger through the air without it disintegrating due to air resistance or being eaten en route by a passing seagull. 
Around 40 local authorities out of 320 in England at the moment have implemented these fast food exclusion zones around schools, which mean that, going forward, no more new takeaways will be allowed to open. We'll find out in the next couple of years whether that has worked. Obviously, there's already an existing high number of takeaways. And obviously, burger cannon technology may yet improve, especially if my most recent patent application is successful. I shudder at the thought. Teresa noted that communicating information about obesity doesn't necessarily change our behaviour. This highlights what psychologists have known in the, for the last 50 years or more, which is that we are much more influenced by our environment than what's inside our heads. And what many of us have known since the late 80s, which is that a room full of Twixes is like a room full of Borg. Resistance is futile. Sadaf agreed. Not with James's room full of Twixes, but with Teresa, who also argued for the influence of biology. How much you eat and how full you feel are traits that are strongly influenced by our genes. People are often quite surprised about this because we tend to think that how we eat and what we eat is more or less voluntary. Apart from when you're at relatives, in which case eating is apparently entirely involuntary. Part of how and what we eat is voluntary. Part of it is learned from exposure in our environment. But a strong part of it is biological and patterned by our genes. Although it is important to note that... Thing one. Personal responsibility. Thing two. Environment and... Thing three. Biology and genes. These three are not three separate things. In fact, Sadaf noted that although it simply isn't enough to advise people to change their diet and activity, this has unfortunately been the cornerstone of UK policy in this area in recent years. Instead, these three things must be considered together in order to make an impact on obesity. Would it therefore be fair to argue that the best place to intervene is in those places where our genetic predisposition and our environment come into contact. Yeah, that's what Teresa said. We also need to remember that even if a policy recognises the role of genes and how these will vary from person to person and recognises that the environment needs to be changed to help people make better decisions, that people's choices will still also depend on their income and healthcare needs. We need a very joined up strategy. Thankfully, we're not stuck for ideas when it comes to obesity interventions. In fact, a lot of what our guests talked about has been included in recent independent reports and government strategies. The problem is that some of the least effective interventions have been implemented, and the political science of implementing policies that are going to make a real difference needs to be examined. Tom reminded us that there have been some successes though. For example, the UK sugar tax. This was a win-win for both consumers and the industry, because drinks companies still sell the same amount of drinks, but these drinks just have less sugar sugar in them. The same could maybe be done for other foods too. Going at scale with more than one intervention, as Teresa put it. We've talked about interventions that have to do with environment and policy and how they are linked, but if obesity is to do with genetics as well, can we find better ways to prevent and treat obesity through genetics and are there pharmaceutical or surgical interventions that we might use in the future? Um, so in response to your question, it's not if it's genetic, it, it is, it's fact, <laughs> okay? It's not a, an idea or a theory, it's fact, um, scientific fact. So um, I think the knowledge that obesity, is that our weight is strongly influenced by our genes um, can guide us in a number of ways. So I think the first and most important way it can guide policy is really to understand the complexity of why people gain weight and why some people are much more likely to gain weight. So it's a really about the approach. So it's about the approach to a policy which relies solely on personal responsibility and thinks that that will be enough to solve the problems we have with obesity. It's highly unlikely to be sufficient when there is a strong biology underlying what we do and how we behave and how we interact with our environment. So I think that's the major contribution that understanding genetics makes. Um, and then the second area where the genetics can make an impact is in the treatment of people with severe obesity. Right. So that's a smaller proportion of people. Um, it's still a million people. Um, but people with severe obesity, that is much more likely to be just strongly genetically driven. Uh, and those people are much more likely to benefit from treatments um, because 
simple changes in diet and exercise are unlikely to be effective in many of those individuals. So I think that's the thing. And then there's a sort of gray area, which is if we understand that in the whole population, there's a sort of graded risk, right? So some people are at higher risk, some people are at lower risk. We can now add that up and we can show that a person with a high risk score is likely to be about 12 kilos heavier by the time they age, reach age 18 than if someone with a low risk score. Okay, just purely just based on adding up the effects of about a million different genetic variants. Um, maybe if we were able to focus resources and attention on people who have a higher risk, might we be able to prevent some of the obesity-related complications in that group? That's a study that needs to be probably done, but we don't know the answer to that. Um, sort of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, um, the proportion of the population with genes that put them at increased risk likely hasn't changed over the last 30, 40 years um, in, in the UK. And um, what we've seen is people's biology um, and their psychology just overwhelmed by these food environments. And we haven't talked about the elephant in the room is who's winning uh, out of all this. So the corporations, um, and uh, as it's sort of mentioned, you know, that they are well aware that they are producing foods that are very hard for us to resist. And we've seen scholars now looking in more detail at uh, corporate interference in public policy at one extreme. Um, we also see that you know, we are in um, a, an environment where uh, the private sector is really important to our economy. And so I think that there's an important trade-off uh, between health and wealth. Uh, and uh, at the moment, health is not winning. So how we shift that? Um, so I think between us, the three of us, we could sketch out what a healthy food and activity environment would look like. Um, it would be radically different. And Sadaf wouldn't have been late uh, arriving for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> she, would been, time to walk here. <laughs> she would have been on her e-bike and there wouldn't have been any cars in the way the quality of the air would have been clean um, and uh, we'd all have eaten and, and drunk different things for our breakfast so I, I think that uh, we're up against some really powerful forces um, that are, if you like, conspiring against our biology and our psychology. I really hope that those shocking figures that were released last week on childhood obesity really do um, empower and embolden uh, politicians and policy makers to work more closely with academics in order to say, OK, uh, we really are going to go further and faster this time. Um, I was going to ask, if you don't mind, um, how each of you thinks about obesity from an individual perspective, by which I mean we've discussed ways in which things, to some extent, out of our control, either our genes or our environment, might affect whether or not we are obese or gain weight at any point in our lives. But I think there's probably a lot of um, negative emotions associated with the idea of being overweight. Certainly, there could be for some people. How do you think about the idea of individual responsibility when it comes to your weight in the context of the research that you do? I think, again, you know, we've been tempted to, to see things as black and white as either personal responsibility or not. Uh, and I think, you know, it's quite clear that responsibility also then, you know, the, the challenge with responsibility is it le leads to blame for people who have not been able to succeed, um, which leads to guilt, uh, which leads to stigma, which leads to discrimination and bias. And actually, we know very well that people who encounter those kind of sentiments – 
particularly from their healthcare professionals, are less likely to be successful at losing weight, are less likely to um, maintain any weight they might lose, and are more likely to have metabolic complications from their obesity. So how we approach the issue and the advice that we give and the care that we give is actually really important and almost as important as what we're doing. So I think one of the fundamental things is how we, is not only what policy changes and what health advice we give, but it's how we give it, Uh, which is why there has been a focus in, in a number of countries and we're beginning to see there is some discussion ongoing with the UK government at the moment um, about talking to people about healthy weight uh, and maintaining a healthy weight versus correcting obesity. Um, now, you know, that's a slightly complicated one because there are medical issues that also have to be dealt with. But I think it, there is quite an important um, area to understand, which is it's about how we communicate things. And that has been a major, I think, uh, uh, a harm that has been caused by policies in the past. Or it it basically, uh, it harms and it it prevents engagement with the very people who may benefit. The way I think about it is the vast majority of people want to be healthy. They value value their health. Um, Most people uh, want to have uh, an enjoyable, healthy diet. And what we're all up against is environments that make it extremely difficult. Uh, Some of my colleagues uh, draw an analogy with with driving. Uh, Most of us don't want to drive recklessly. And so uh, we've got environments and rules around us that enable us all to drive safely. And so I think that's why our focus, well, our our focus, uh, well, my focus is driven by the evidence. And I can see that in our current environment, unless you've got extraordinary resource, you live in an area of uh, high affluence, uh, it's extremely difficult to keep your your body weight within the normal range. Um, uh, We know that at the moment, 63% of adults in the UK are overweight or obese. So our current environments make it normal to be overweight or obese. It's not that people want to be overweight or obese. So that's how I think about personal responsibility. And just to add to that, I mean, I agree with everything that Sadaf and Teresa have said, but uh, I, I, I would be, you know, happy for everybody to have the opportunity to live a healthy lifestyle, you know, if, if that's the, the choice that they want to make. But just the reality is that at the moment, in many, many spheres, that is not the situation as it stands. And that's what we need to work towards. So what's the takeaway when it comes to our weight and our genes? Well, Sadaf said that the fact that our weight is strongly influenced by our genes can guide us in a number of ways. For example, this knowledge can guide policy by injecting a more nuanced and accurate understanding of why some people gain weight more easily than others. A policy which relies solely on personal responsibility is highly unlikely to be particularly successful when there is a strong biological or genetic driver underlying what we do how we behave and how we interact with our environment. This knowledge can also help guide the treatment of people with severe obesity, which is around a million people in the UK. These people are much more likely to benefit from treatment which in some way recognises the biological side to obesity. Simple changes in diet and exercise are unlikely to be effective in many of those individuals. Genetics can also tell us an individual's risk of obesity. Some people are at a higher risk, some at a lower risk, and a person with a higher risk score is going to be on average about 12 kilos heavier by the time they reach age 18. If we were able to focus resources and attention on people who have a higher risk, we might be able to prevent some of the obesity-related complications in this group. Teresa said that the proportion of the UK population with genes that put them at increased risk of obesity has changed over the last 30 to 40 years. People's biology and their psychology is overwhelmed by newer food environments. 
Corporations are well aware that they are producing foods that are very hard for us to resist. Once you pop, you can't stop, don't forget. And we've seen researchers now looking in more detail at corporate interference in public policy. The private sector is really important to our economy, so there's an important trade-off between health and wealth. At the moment, health is not winning. How do we shift that? Can we? Hard to say. We're up against powerful forces that are conspiring against our biology and psychology. Sounds like a case for Mulder and Scully. And we ended the discussion with the guests' view on the stigma around obesity and the idea of individual responsibility. Yeah, Sadaf said it's not just what health advice we give, but it's how we give it. Apparently, there are some ongoing discussions at the moment with the UK government about talking to people about maintaining a healthy weight rather than the idea of correcting obesity. Teresa noted that people value their health and want an enjoyable, healthy diet. Don't we all? But we're all up against environments that make this extremely difficult. The room of Borg Twixes again. Your biological and technological distinctiveness will be added to our Twix. But we're all up against environments that make this extremely difficult. The room of Borg Twixes again. Your biological and technological distinctiveness will be added to our Twix. Teresa had a great analogy with driving. Most of us don't want to drive recklessly, so we've got environments and rules that help us all to drive safely, like speed bumps near a school. So why not create environments and rules that enable us to eat healthily? Unfortunately, our current environments make it normal to be overweight or obese. It's not that people want to be overweight or obese. But unfortunately, Tom concluded that the opportunities simply aren't there for everyone to live a healthy lifestyle. Instead, that's what we need to work towards. Well, looks like we've reached the end of another episode. Stay tuned for our next episode on mental health. Before then, please spread the mind over chatter word. Who do you know whose life is simply incomplete without our voices in their ears? And please fill out our survey to tell us what you think of the podcast. You can find the link to the survey in the episode description. We want it all. The good, the bad and the ugly. Oh, and please make sure to leave us a review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. We like reviews. Hopefully a good one, not a bad one, or an ugly one. Huge thanks once again to our guests, Sadaf Faruqi, Teresa Marteau, and Thomas Bourgoyne. And finally, a big thank you to the sickly talented Carlo Ladd for our music and the equally talented Alex Sadler for our artwork. See you, See next, you next time. time.